Hello and welcome everyone to the Series A list with Rain Ventures, the live webcast where we'll be introducing you to some of the top founders and early stage venture capitalists in the world. I'm Erica Dagdon Minahan, and I'm usually here with my Rain Ventures co founder, Monique Idlet Mosley, every month to feature amazing entrepreneurs and investors that have built fantastic businesses and are generous enough to share their stories with us. So you're going to get the real deal here on the Series A list. Uh, unfortunately, Monique is not able to join us today. We all hope that she's feeling better soon. You probably know that venture capital has long been a closed system and many startup founders are unsure how or even if venture capital can be a tool to help them grow their businesses. So we're going to be pulling back the curtain on early stage venture capital, introducing you to top founders and investors in the space and answering the big question, what does it take to get to Series A? So today, I'm so thrilled to invite our next guest consumer tech founder and innovator, Amanda Zuckerman. Amanda's the founder of Dormify, the innovative new brand that makes it super easy to get an Instagrammable dorm room. Before we get started, I wanna remind everybody that we're really excited to take your questions at the end. So please add any questions that you have for Amanda to the chat or the Q&A tab. And if you're in the chat, let's be friendly, say hi and let us know where you're tuning in from. So great, Amanda, how are you doing? I love the background. Thank you, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on here. And I had to be on brand with my background. So this is a real <laughs> dormify look. <laughs> so inspirational and cute. Uh, I also <laughs> wanna mention that Amanda was one of our very first Rain Ventures portfolio companies. And I think I had known her for quite a few years before we made the first investment, I'd been following her growth and progress, right, Amanda? Yeah, it was um, really great to get to know you over, I think it was like a year and a half or two years before yeah. we actually got to um, make a move, so. <laughs> yeah, well, it felt like a long time, you know, I think that time sort of condensed during the pandemic, but I'm pretty sure I definitely met you well before the pandemic started. Yeah. So, um, wonderful. Well, you know, uh, one of the first things that our audience would like to know is a little bit about your background and what it was that inspired you to take the leap and become an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, um, similar to a lot of very curious college students, I came up with the idea for Dormify when I was entering my freshman year. So, um, just to kind of go back a few years. This was in 2009. Um, I was shopping for my very first dorm room with my mom and very quickly realized that there wasn't a brand that was owning this space. And it was really challenging for me to find twin XL bedding, which is the required size for college. Um, twin XL bedding that was actually stylish and designed for an 18 year old. So not only did I not find this stylish bedding, there wasn't one place to get everything that you needed for your, for your dorm room and um, saw a huge opportunity to just create a line of bedding that was more in line with what people my age were looking for. So um, my mom's background is actually in um, advertising. She started a creative agency before I was even born. So together we said, we need to solve this problem. And with the you know, background and support of her agency and her experience, we were able to do so. And we started with a blog and um, an influence, not an influencer, a student ambassador community before we even went into figuring out how to manufacture textiles. So um, I think the takeaway here is we really focused on building a great brand and that's not always where founders or people with ideas start. And we knew that there was a problem to solve, but we started with creating a great brand. Um, and I think that that has been a huge part of our success to date. Um, but we founded the company when I was in college by my dorm, by my junior year, I actually had dormify bedding in my room, which was really cool. Amazing. And I've just been growing it ever since. So. so cool. And so how old were you when you first started working on the business? So when I was in college, I didn't spend like my full time schedule working on the business. It was more of like a hobby and a side hustle at the time. 
Um, and remember, this was before so social media really was what it is today. So I think there's a lot more pressure to move fast now. And if I was 18 or 19 today, I definitely would have made it a full-time venture. But um, by the time I graduated, I started spending full-time um, on it. But 2010 is technically when they started. Okay, amazing. So, you know, one of the things that a lot of folks know is that at Rain, we only invest in technology companies, right? So what is it that makes Dormify also a technology company? How have you been able to use tech to break into a market that's dominated by the big, big brands like Target and Bed Bath and Beyond as a newly graduated, uh, you know, new college graduate? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit a traditional, but um, we are really trying to differentiate ourselves from the other big box retailers that are in our space by um, having a very unique and relevant and authentic uh, POV on content. So we're really focused on content and interactive tools on our site. So not only are we selling the product that um, students need to have a functional and stylish dorm room. We're actually providing them with tools um, that make it much more seamless and much more fun to actually design their space. Um, we built this visualizer tool that we're continuing to evolve and iterate on that really acts like um, a look builder. So in the same way that you, you would build an outfit and mix and match different pieces to complete a look, um, you do that for your bed, and that's really the bread and butter of our business is how we merchandise um, the products that we're creating. So that's one really important tool that has been um, really successful. And then on the social side, we have really prioritized and focused on our social content on TikTok and on Instagram and really um, building unique and entertaining content to keep our customer engaged year round. Yeah. So what do you think, you know, are some of the things that you've learned about how to use technology to actually find your customers and build a relationship with them? Like, what do you think are some of your biggest learnings without sharing your, your trade secrets? <laughs> well, I think that no matter how big you get, you can't forget about the scrappy things that got you there. And you can't, um, think that you're too big to do the more grassroots type of initiative. So I will say that we're doing some of the same customer acquisition stuff that might be manual and might be time consuming, but it really works and it's scrappy and it's grassroots and it's all about spreading the brand organically and through word of mouth. Um, we do that in a few different ways, whether it's through, you know, just our standard uh, social content, our brand ambassadors, influencers um, that we have partnerships with and proactive outreach that we do to find our customer. But um, I will say like, just kind of flipping your question around, we're, we oftentimes find success in the things that are less technologically powered mm -hmm. that are more manual just because it's so targeted and it's so personal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we need to keep doing that because we are going after a new customer who is entering college every single year. And it's not as, you know, it's, it's not as much of a machine as it may be in some other businesses. Yeah. And that's a really great point because, you know, there was a period of time, maybe a decade ago where, you know, people sort of thought, okay, it's plug and play. You know, you just use these social channels, you pay for customer acquisition and, you know, those days are really gone, right? They've extracted all the value they can possibly extract, leaving exactly. very little on the table for startups. Um, but one of the things I think is really interesting, you know, being a young founder and, you know, as they say, less chuggy than some of some of the rest of us in the room, <laughs> um, were you able to use innovations like TikTok and some of the other things the kids are doing these days to really get an edge on some of your competitors? For sure, because I think um, very simply put, I don't know any teenager that's going to follow I'll just name them Bed Bath and Beyond on TikTok. Like as much as Bed Bath and Beyond would want to have a presence on TikTok, it's very difficult for any brand, even if it's a Gen Z brand, to develop an organic presence on that platform. A lot of brands are really relying on the creators and the influencers to do the work for them, and you oftentimes find that 
the content that gets the most engagement is maybe tagging a brand or a hashtag, um, but not actually produced by the brand. And we have really focused on building our own presence um, because we believe that Dormify is more than just a brand. It's a personality. It's a person. We are your big sister um, when you are transitioning into this and very like exciting but nerve wracking time of your life. So um, I think it definitely gives us an edge. And I think that it's a really important channel if this is where you are connecting with your customers. So it's not the case for everyone, but for us, we're Gen Z and we have to be relevant where Gen Z is. Yeah. Well, I know that one of the biggest challenges for D 2 C brands and consumer tech companies in general of 2021 has been the changes with cookies and new privacy regulation. How has that affected the way you have to think about customer acquisition? Well, this has definitely been a learning year and a transition year. And I think that like everyone, we are seeing where we can't rely on old habits anymore. Um, so we're really leaning more into, again, community focused initiatives, ambassadors and influencers. And we've seen so much success with the influencer partnerships, whether they're paid or unpaid that we've done. So shifting budget into more paid collaborations is something that we're thinking about, but also um, shifting budget from Instagram into TikTok and really figuring out how to advertise effectively on TikTok and on YouTube and even Snapchat, um, because all of those channels are, you know, different than Facebook and Instagram, but a lot of opportunity and we haven't diversified completely yet. So influencer marketing, you know, it's been around for a while, but it's still a little bit of an unknown quantity, you know, a, a wild west, you know, what are some of the things that you've learned about influencer marketing from being in it and doing it? learned a ton. Um, it's, you wouldn't believe how into the weeds and how, uh, like nitty gritty we get with the details of who we're going to work with, because you cannot, um, just rely on what you see somewhat on the surface. When you're looking at influencers, you really have to study their audiences and how their audiences are reacting to their content and engaging with it. So we have, um, really learned what success means for working with an influencer. And oftentimes we see more conversion with those mo more micro influencers. And that's just because their followings are so dedicated and um, loyal to them. But something else that um, Erica, we talked about recently is just the product collaboration and being able to tie um, a personality that um, is, you know, really, attractive and people really love to a collection or a look or a product. So we're going to be doing even more of that. But we have found this year that having some sort of identity to a collection um, has really helped to drive traffic and also even convert on that person's look because these students really want to emulate what their favorite celebrities are doing. And these influencers are more celebrities to them and like A-list celebrities than what we know of as an A-list celebrity. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, that was a little bit sort of on your business challenges and execution. You know, the next thing that I kind of want to dive into is your experience with fundraising, right? So, you know, you're a young woman, you know, you're, you're out of college, you, you're trying to build this business and you realize, geez, we need capital to do this. So how did you go through the process of deciding to raise capital and what were some of the important things that you learned? So we've raised um, capital from a variety of different sources. So it's been learnings along the way, every step. And we started um, years ago when we first uh, were investing in inventory, we started with friends and family and had a lot of success going to friends and family. Um, and something that was very clear from those early seed rounds were we were going to be most successful when approaching someone in our network that has gone through the college process or has a child that's going to be going to college soon. So that's really how we um, targeted our outreach and our fundraising, which is something that's pretty relatable for anyone who's, you know, just trying to get started. 
that was really helpful. So find then, someone who sort of understands the problem that you're solving really well and is it, about it. It's impossible to like for someone who hasn't gone through it themselves, it's five times as hard to tell them that the problem exists. Whereas if you go to someone who's been through it before, they already are across that hump and it's really about how you're gonna fix it. So it's just less obstacles to climb, I would say. And um, no matter what the business or the, the technology is, um, you need to start with the people that get it first because it's just gonna be so much harder. Um, and then the next step after we had raised money from friends and family, um, we went about a fundraising process and we actually ended up raising um, a series A that was led by a strategic partner, American Eagle Outfitters. And that was definitely um, a unique investor and they hadn't really done many minority investments before. Um, we had others in the round, but that was a really great experience because they did understand the brand. They did understand how important home decor for this customer is. And um, I think it kind of follows along the same theme that I first mentioned. And then um, more recently, we- Well, actually, sorry, before we jump onto the recent round, I mean, one of the questions I'd love to get your feedback on is, you know, what are some of the things that one wants to be considerate of when, when thinking about taking strategic investment versus a traditional venture firm versus, you know, some of the other yeah. options that you may or may not have had? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's- A lot it's of folks, you know, sort of wonder, you know, what should I be thinking about when I'm making that decision? Right. Well, if you have the, if you have options, I guess. Then, the luxury yeah. of choice, which <laughs> yeah. most people don't. All right. I mean, yeah. I, and that's such a great thing to point out is that so many people think, oh, well, when I'm raising money and I'm like picking which investors, it's like, okay, that's a very small percentage of people that are just sort of picking which investors, but right. go ahead. Right. But I think, I mean, across the board, just more general thoughts or comments, um, really thinking about what you're looking for or what is most important to you and the person that is going to be involved or not involved. So are you looking for a active or a passive investor? Do you want the help or do you want to steer clear of someone who's going to be on your back? Things like that, you might not have the choice, but um, with a strategic, it's probably likely that they will have great experience or introductions or, um, a, a great network to tap into, but they're not going to be as involved um, in a day to day because of various reasons and they're running their own business. Um, but also like, I think the, the pro with the strategic is they get it to a degree and might have more relevant resources to you um, that could just be more valuable in the long run. And then with you know, friends and family and maybe earlier stage, again, might not have much choice, but the number of people that you want to have on your cap table to get started. I know we started with a ton of people on our cap table. And as you grow and as you bring in other um, investors to the business it becomes a bit more complicated. So, um, you know, you might have to compile people into you know, smaller vehicles just to have less people um, that are grouped together. But I think, um, I guess I would just end my thought with people really need to believe in you and understand the business and like have your back as a human, I would say. I, I feel like I have peers that um, have investors that are very one dimensional and only care about what they're getting and not the people growing the business and don't care about having a relationship with that person. So um, I'm fortunate enough to have really great investors that I do have relationships with, but definitely heard from others that it can be challenging when um, goals are not aligned. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's a great thing to, to be thoughtful about. Um, you know, back to your series A, you know, what were, you know, obviously there's a, a much higher hurdle for companies that are more, you know, consumer focused, less of, you know, sort of a software product. 
What were yeah. some of the KPIs and metrics that you felt, you know, you needed to reach in order for this to be something, a raise you could get done in the market? And I understand that because you ended up with a strategic investor, you know, they're obviously going to be looking, you know, investing for different reasons, yeah. um, you know, but, but what bar did you guys need to sort of get to in order to justify being able to raise a series A? Sure. So, and the round that we just raised was our series B, sorry. but yeah, so it no, was, I know. Right, your, your previous round to this. So yes, yeah, Series A. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm just gonna share learnings from both rounds because I think that they were very different processes, but um, something that proved to be a problem very, or a challenge very early on with our raising our Series A um, was the metrics that traditional VCs were looking for were not metrics that we would be able to show. So when we talk about retention, like a lot of people kind of blocked us out off the bat from seeing our, our top 10 metrics that we were sharing in a list view because they were not seeing like a certain minimum threshold that they would want to see to consider a business. So we had to figure out a better way to tell the story and own that and say, look, like we're not going to be able to show this number given our current business model we're very seasonal we have a new set of customers every single year we do have a really low customer acquisition cost and you know we're getting payback on our first order but that retention metric was a really big challenge for us so i i think that this could be present in many businesses that aren't you know a subscription model or that don't have that recurring revenue stream and you just have to retell the story in a different way and own and not hide from the things that are gonna be revealed like very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just in storytelling, how we present our deck, um, those are some of the things that we learned very early on. But then to take that a step further, we then changed how we approached our prospecting. And we quickly saw that after many failed meetings um, with people that we're just not going to get over that hump of, okay, the, the business model, I'm not going to get behind. We went after different investors and had to take a more um, curated approach, whether that was going to family offices um, in the retail business that understood our business a bit better, um, or just going to like less traditional funds that were a little bit more accommodating to the story that we were telling. So those are two big takeaways that really helped us. And then when we went to go raise our series B, we had already kind of eliminated a lot of the things that we, the people or the, not the people, the funds that we had um, learned from in, in the first round. So, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your series B, you know, and this is great guys. She's past series A as many of our, our portfolio company founders are. So tell us about the process of raising the series B and, you know, um, you have an amazing lead investor for that round, uh, Clarice Growth Capital. Tell us how were you able to sort of connect with them and know that you'd found a good match? Yeah. And it was really challenging because it was during COVID. So we had kicked off this fundraising process really at the Q4 of 20, 2019 time period. And then of course, in Q1 of 2020, COVID happened. Um, so we paused, but when we first got started, um, we were spending a lot of time really finding those people that were so niche. And at the stage that we were at, we were somewhat like too late stage for a lot of new funds that were female focused or um, just new and looking at the space in a more innovative way. So we were too large for some and then we were too small for private equity and we had to find the right like niche market, I guess, for investors that were in that growth capital stage. And that was hard. So it was a lot of networking. Um, through founders, through other investors that might not be a fit for us, but I spent a year <laughs> meeting people and getting introductions to other people and finding ways to get introductions, which is the name of the game when it comes to fundraising. But because we were looking for something so specific, um, it was a very targeted search. But with 
the relationship that we had built with um, the Clarity Partners, I can speak a little bit more about that. I think the takeaway here really is building relationships really is the most important thing and maintaining those relationships because Alexandra Wilson, who is one of the partners, um, she is an entrepreneur and has founded Guilt and a few other businesses in her past. And I had met her maybe five years ago. My mom had met her separately even longer before. And she always kind of knew about Dormify. And I, as a young entrepreneur, have always said yes to everything. And every event that I don't want to go to because I can't get up in the morning. I make myself go because you never know who you're going to meet there. And I'll never forget this because I had been traveling and I was exhausted and had an 8 a.m. event that a friend through another networking event had invited me to. And it was pouring rain. It was just like the worst time to go to an event. And that's where I met Lisa, her par Alexandra's partner for the first time. So from there, like right place, right time for sure. But I think everything happens for a reason. And we just kept in conversation over the entire pandemic. She was raising, they were raising their fund at the time. So they weren't ready to make any investments, but we were talking to many other investors at the time and just giving updates to Lisa and Alexandra throughout the entire summer, which is our peak um, shopping season. So I think the, you know, the takeaways are, say yes to everything, maintain relationships, and also just check in with people, um, even if you don't have a need. So it's a good reminder to myself, a lot of the people that I met through the fundraising process, I should shoot a quick note to and say, here's what's going on. You know, we raised in April or we closed our round in April and here's how our season ended up. But just poking yourself into someone's inbox and making sure that they remember you once a quarter or something, I think is a really helpful tool. Yeah, absolutely. That's my number one piece of advice that I give to founders, you know, get folks on a list and send out, you know, a monthly, if you're ambitious or quarterly update so that people feel like they have an opportunity to get to know you, even if they're not seeing you in person several times a year. Exactly. Um, so, you know, a lot of startup founders focus on revenue growth at the very early stage. Do you yeah. think that that's the most important thing, you know, or are there some other KPIs that you think founders should consider in the beginning to um, get investors excited? And it sounds like you've been through, you know, seeing the list of all the metrics that a lot of these investors have had. Well, I think through my experience, a lot of um, other metrics have definitely proved to be really important. So um, early stage or even later than that, showing how an audience loves your brand or your business, that customer love, that more soft type of thing, I think goes a long way, whether that's manifested through um, your email list, your social following, like how many people are engaged with what you're saying? And there could be other factors that are contributing to revenue. Maybe it's inventory and cash flow and all of that um, if you're in an inventory business. But I do think, um, you know, MPS and uh, engagement on social platforms is really important. I think every single investor that we spoke to, if they, um, you know, were not interested in continuing conversations or they were, we're really proud of the brand that we had built and the loyal customer following that they had built. And in most cases, um, hopefully they had someone in their life that kind of came back to them later and said, Hey, like my niece just told me that she got everything that she um, ordered from Dormify and how much she loved it. So getting some of that, like in the wild type of feedback, mm -hmm. They're always really proud of that. I think that's important to get more tactical and in, in more of the financial metrics. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, traffic and, and just excitement from people that are visiting your website or your app or whatever it might be, I think is really important. Um, 
Erica, I don't know. Is there anything that you think is really important? Like, well, you know, I think you covered a few of the important things, right? Which is that engagement is really, really important. So, you know, whether you have an app or software, but to make sure that people truly love the product, right? You're not just showing that you can sell something, but that you're, you found, you know, a customer base, I think that people really love. I'm sure for you, returns is sort of like churn might be for folks who have, you know, a SaaS product. I right. want to make sure that they don't want to return the product, that they want to hang right. on to it um, and continue to be loyal customers. Um, right. And so speaking of which, you know, one of the biggest pieces of, of advice that we give is to make sure that, you know, folks have found product market fit before they focus on growth. Uh, so that they're not just sort of like burning through their customer acquisition dollars. You know, I'd love to know what you have learned about the biggest challenges that you've faced in actually scaling your business, you know, especially when, you know, you've got to use micro influencers and reach everybody on a really grassroots level. Um, So Mm -hmm. what have been some of those challenges and how have you put together systems to overcome them? Well, I think, you know, specific to Dormify, scaling our high touch customer service and experience is definitely something that's a challenge as we scale. And um, from things like our our customer service team um, and being a seasonal business, we outsourced to an agency for the first time this year. And it was really important that we um, integrated that team into our own in-house team in a really seamless way to be able to scale that. And you know, some of those growing pains that have, of course, like are all good things. They're, they just become more challenging when you don't have um, a smaller group of people that are talking to our customers 24 seven. So that feedback loop and, you know, making sure that they're representing the brand well, is definitely a challenge in scale. Um, in addition, I think that, let's see, um, even with, I guess just market share. So there's definitely different markets that really know us and we have a really strong presence. And now we're at the point where we want to continue to grow within those strong markets, but how do you balance the markets that you focused on with entering new markets? And um, it's probably different initiatives or different channels that are going to allow you to do that. So the marketing strategy and the go-to-market strategy just becomes more complex and um we've you know in early days it's focus on acquisition 100 percent. and now how are we going to retain that student but also that family and the next student that's going to be going to college or the post-grad apartment dweller so everything just becomes more complex and with more people of course people management and as a founder and CEO being able to manage or balance the people management versus the growth initiatives is definitely a challenge as you grow. Well, that brings us to our next question, which is, you know, what are some of the things you've learned about building a team? And, you know, what are some of the unexpected challenges that you faced? Because you've got over 20 folks on the team now, right? So it's, it's yeah. and, and growing. Yeah. So um, I think challenges are just level setting as time goes on and as you grow. So whether that's how, you know, levels and, and titles look within an organization um, over time and the evolution of that and how you balance bringing in new talent versus talent that's been with you for a number of years and making sure that that's seamless and making sure that those early employees are treated just as well, if not better than um, newcomers into the business and making sure that you're like really nurturing those relationships. Um, Things that I've learned about managing a team, uh, a regret that I have is uh, not bringing a people or people operations person in sooner. I met someone who was the first head of people at her company and she couldn't have stressed more how important it was to like bring that role on very early, especially if you were planning to scale your team quickly. And I just think back to that conversation all the time that I waited a little bit too long, but 
um, you have to make choices and make sacrifices when budgets are tight too. Um, so we were really focused on revenue generating positions early on. Um, but I don't know. It's also interesting to, as a young person, to manage a team that likely has a lot more experience, years of experience than you. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really struggled with that. I, I think it's just bringing the right people in, in the right roles that shouldn't be a problem, but um, it's definitely something to navigate when you are a young person. Mm -hmm. I think it's just daunting to manage people who have more years experience on you. And it's hard to, to like remember that you know the business best. Yeah, um, and yeah. I tell myself that all the time. And it's of course most successful when everyone is rallied around the same goals and um, have these employees have the same respect for you that you have for them. So I haven't really struggled with it, but I can imagine that that could be challenging um, as you get started too. But I think it's important and you want to bring in people to the team early on that fully complement you and aren't duplicative to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it's definitely challenging to be a young CEO um, and to, you know, have to manage people who, you know, have much more years of experience. And I just want to say, I think that you're doing a fantastic job and uh, with a, an incredible amount of competence and confidence. So we're really proud of, you know, your ability to uh, get it done and to, you know, build a team that's excited about the product. And I do think it's very interesting because, uh, you know, that might be a less common situation, but, you know, in a, a category where your audience is this particular age, it's probably pretty helpful <laughs> to actually have the seat. Well, I'm old now. I'm yeah. 30 and I'm like <laughs> trying to stay connected to them as much as possible. So I have as many 18 year olds in my phone Hanging that I around. text. <laughs> you got to get in their Snapchat groups. Okay. Seriously. Yeah, I do. Get in their Snapchat groups. So you're right. What you're talking about. <laughs> Wonderful. So I want to make sure that I cover some of the great questions that we've got from the audience. Audience. And uh, I think the first one was from Jacqueline and hi, Regina. Hi, Gina. Hi, Hugo. We've got some great people here. Um, Jacqueline says, hi, everyone. My name is Jacqueline, founder of the girls room. I believe Amanda was part of an Envision Fest where she heard you talk about Dormify. Okay. She was just saying hello. It wasn't a question. So hi, <laughs> she's met you before. Um, hi, so, so Sabrina asks, is a strategic investor one who's already in the space of the company and seeking to stay relevant through them, i.e. American Eagle? Um, more strategic to us than we are to them, but I think that there is definitely like mutual benefit that we share. So um, we were already working with American Eagle in a capacity. We were um, selling our product wholesale to them and we were really helping them to introduce home into their overall assortment. So I don't know if there's necessarily one way to define a strategic investor, but I would say that it's any investor who brings more than capital to the relationship and likely has um, synergies. I don't, what would you say, Erica? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, very often it can be a customer, a distribution partner, a manufacturer, um, a potential acquirer. So, you know, there are a lot of different categories, but generally it means, you know, you're taking investment from uh, an entity that isn't sort of strictly, you know, an investment manager um, mm -hmm. and, you know, should be able to be additive uh, to the company in some way. And I would say that, you know, particularly through um, my, you know, investing experience um, on a thousand angels where we could invest a little bit more in consumer products type companies, um, we saw quite a few companies end up raising from strategics. So large corporations that, you know, were looking to sort of piggyback on some of the innovation in their space and not be left behind. Uh, we also have a question from Sabrina. What technologies or APIs do you plug in with to manage your company workflow and life? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Definitely don't Top manage hacks. <laughs> <laughs> Um my team uses Asana, which is a project management platform, and it's been really helpful. Um, 
over the last few years that we've used it. And most of these technologies now plug into each other in many different capacities. So um, Slack we use for communication and Asana connects to Slack. And um, there's a few different automations that you can set up within Slack and within Asana um, in order to make workflow more seamless. Um, but that has been really helpful to us so far. And then something that I'll just share, if it might be relevant to this group, it might not be, but um, virtual assistants and that type of resource is also really helpful, especially when you don't wanna spend a lot of money on that type of thing, but you do need the help. So whether that's um, using a Calendly calendar to schedule meetings and not have to spend your own time scheduling things, particularly during a fundraising process, um, or if during a fundraising process, you um, link up with a virtual assistant or a true assistant that can help you with some of the more logistical things. I actually work with an assistant who is a part of an organization called Squared Away. And it's a really cool story. It is a company that is founded by a military spouse. And she was really having a hard time finding work when she was moving around the country so often around the world. And she started a remote assistant and administrative support company called Squared Away. So you just pay hourly, you're paired with someone very quickly. And it's a good way to like ramp up and ramp down um, if you need help just for a short period of time. That's excellent. Yeah, I've definitely heard of them. Um, and it's a great resource and a great way to uh, bring some amazing unused uh, female talent onto your team to support you at, at, a, at a reasonable price. Definitely, you know, uh, a couple of things that we use that that we really love here at Rain Ventures that might be helpful to you is, you know, we use Superhuman for email, which I think I really love. And I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting uh, that folks don't really realize about venture capital firms is that we also have to spend uh, a disproportionate amount of our lives fundraising. So we, we also need really great fundraising tools and Superhuman is great for that. Also a big fan of Calendly, um, you know, one of the newest uh, black founded and owned uh, like uh, three times unicorn <laughs> that came out this year. So absolutely uh, excited to support them and a fantastic product. Uh, and then we also use Notion and Airtable for, you know, document uh, and sort of spreadsheet management. So those might be helpful to you guys. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Jacqueline asked, which I think is really interesting, and, you know, unfortunately, Amanda's got a huge advantage here because of, you know, her mom's background, but she said, uh, before working with investors, you know, what were some of the original steps you needed to take? Did you have a suggestion for how to create decks and what resources did you use? And I know your decks have always been really, really fabulous. Uh, so, because you have the in-house team, right? <laughs> well, and I'm also a graphic designer, so that, that right. helps too. Um, <laughs> yeah. our, decks were always, our decks were always really pretty, which is great, but it's only as good as the content that you're putting in it. Um, and I guess a few tactical um, pieces of advice. We, when we first started fundraising, we just put together a deck based upon what we thought was right. And we've collected feedback over time. So whether that is, um, connecting with other founders to take notes on like what their outline of content is, getting feedback from people you might not be pitching to before you go out and start pitching. Um, you can kind of get a lot of the feedback from people who are knowledgeable prior to starting the process. Um, Erica, you might have some thoughts on resources to go to, but I think as much of like a test run that you can do to go into it, putting your best foot forward rather than getting feedback from people that you could have approached differently and you might've lost out on, on them. I, I would suggest doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and one of the things I think um, that's really helpful is there's a ton of information on YouTube. You know, we always post our episodes of the series A list on YouTube. And if you go into our YouTube channel, uh, you'll see that we have a ton of content around sort of format for investor decks and sort of like the, the linear thinking that most VCs use and what want to see when they're evaluating an opportunity. Um, 
you know, one of the things I would say is I see a lot of founders place, you know, a lot of uh, emphasis on their product in a pitch deck when actually investors are really looking for, for something different, which is that they're trying to understand your system for making money and, you know, sort of what uh, intellectual property you have already in terms of like team and talent. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a ton of information on the on on YouTube. I would I would suggest, and on the internet in general, and examples of pitch decks. Um, one of my portfolio companies from uh, Dream Adventures is a company called Slide Bean, which does a sort of uh, pitch deck, sort of alternative soft software. But similarly, they also have a very robust uh, content presence on YouTube where I think they do breakdowns of like every single, you know, successful early stage pitch deck that's been out there. So, you know, take advantage of that information and, you know, look at look at as many examples of great decks as you can as you work to iterate and improve on yours. And it's also a really difficult process. I mean, all I have done for the last 15 years is look at and evaluate presentations. And when it was time for us to do our presentation for Rain Ventures, I mean, I honestly made something terrible. So it also <laughs> took me many, many, many years. I was like going back to it. I was like, how did I even do this? Like, I know what, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's a really, really hard thing to kind of, you know, get that right messaging across. So it takes everybody a lot of work. Uh, great. And so um, last question uh, uh, says, uh, I was going to give one more. Oh, sorry. Question. Go ahead. Like, Go ahead. Um, and read this and you probably agree with this, but once you have a deck as a second step, having a really short blurb that is like tried and true and something that you can shoot off quickly and also having a one sheeter version of your deck that summarizes the most important information. I really recommend having those three pieces ready to go at all times, not just the deck. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so we will take uh, one last question, uh, which is, can you talk a little bit about the early stages of building out the tech side of the product um, and how did you get that off the ground? Um, did you teach yourself the skills to produce an MVP or did you have to find a developer? So um, in my case, the we were working with a developer. I think if we were a true tech product, not a retail business, um, it would be important to have a technical co-founder and not, you're not always um, at the first step of your idea going to have that technical person. So it's a really important hire. But for me, um, we worked with the team that developed our website, which was a part of an agency. Um, we're actually rebuilding it right now. So I think the important thing is if you're your product is the technology, then it's important to have those people in house. If your product is not necessarily the technology, in our case, um, go to the experts and really determine whether there's an app that you can customize and build upon, or if you really need to build it from scratch, um, because there's, especially within e-commerce and in Shopify, a lot of third-party apps that do a lot of the work for you. Yeah, no, that that's a great question, Sabrina. And you know, just as a follow up on that, I'd love to know: Did you ever feel a little overwhelmed or you know uh, uncertain when you're dealing with and you know sort of a third party developer that you know you would sort of know what was going on from a technology perspective? What did you have to do to get up to speed? Well, we've always had um, a strong product manager on our team that really played that role of being the liaison between the business and the developer. So that's a really key role while you're building something so that you do have that strong communication between the two teams. Um, and typically you have that on both sides so that the less technical people um, or the more technical people are doing the technical stuff and then someone else is able to speak about it. Um, but I think, you know, it really depends on the business, but being built on Shopify just has made everything so much easier because it's such a great platform. So we migrated onto Shopify a few years ago and, you know, technology today in the e-commerce space is amazing, really self-serving. Uh, like you can do a lot on your own without really technical development help. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what's, what's come out in the last, you know, five to 10 years. Um, Wonderful. Well, you know, thank you so much, Amanda. Can you tell uh, our audience uh, how they can learn more about Dormify and maybe buy some? And by the way, Dormify 
uh, items are not just for dorm rooms, actually. They're perfect for <laughs> a guest room, a kid's room, your kid going off to summer camp, uh, your your regular bedroom. I mean, you can see all the beautiful graphic design they have. You know, I might actually, we're, we're redecorating our bedroom. I might have to get some, <laughs> some posters and frame them. So, they're so, so cute. Uh, so how can people uh, purchase uh, items, become a Dormify fan? Sure. Um, so you can visit our website, dormify.com, where we have all of our products. And I, I didn't even mention this, um, at the top of the call, but a majority of our products are designed by our team and manufactured by us. So it's exclusive product to the brand. Um, we have really great giftable items for the upcoming holiday season, like throw blankets and um, candles and great pillows. Um, and then you can follow along on Instagram and TikTok at Dormify. And um, you can follow me personally. If you have any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer via DM on Instagram. I'm just at Amanda Zuckerman. And I would definitely recommend following her on TikTok and Instagram. The TikTok particularly is very entertaining. <laughs> so, very entertaining. A lot of inspiration. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. And I hope you all will join us again next month where we'll be meeting another amazing Reinventure CEO. And if you're a founder looking to raise capital, please contact us and submit your pitch at rainvc.com. Thank you so much. And everyone have an awesome week.